Adulting is Easy podcast. This is your host, Lauren. And today we're going to make adulting easier by making money easier. Please rate and review when you get a chance. Today I'm joined by Steve, who achieved financial independence and quit his full-time job at only 35. Today he and his wife live in a small off-grid home in the Arizona desert. Thanks for joining me, Steve. You are very welcome. Thanks for having me. This episode is brought to everybody by Steadily Insurance. Steadily covers many kinds of properties, even Airbnbs and VRBOs. If you rent property to others, please support this podcast by clicking the link in the show notes and getting a quote. So our goal, as I said, is to make adulting easier for listeners by discussing a personal finance topic, since managing money is such a big part of adulting. Today, Steve, you and I are going to talk about your journey to financial independence. And so you retired at 35 years old. How old were you when you started thinking, I'm going to retire before normal retirement age? That's a good question. I think it was more like 30 or 31. It didn't really, it never really occurred to me that that, that this was going to be possible, uh, especially right after I got out of college and I got the full-time job and I was making some money and naturally I wanted to spend that money because I was finally making something that you know I could be, I could be proud of. I wasn't working for minimum wage anymore. And that was, you know, you you kind of fall into this trap, I guess, um, golden handcuffs, I guess they uh, they call it, where you're making good money and then you want to spend good money because you feel like, you know, you worked hard for this, you deserve it. And, you know, if that goes unchecked and that very, that was exactly what was happening with me, um, it can get out of hand very, very quickly and then nobody's retiring early. Yes, that's a good point. So, and we often hear about this called like lifestyle creep. So, it's the idea of you make ten thousand yeah. more dollars, you spend ten thousand, or even worse, eleven thousand more dollars than you were before, right? So, so you experienced some of that. I was going to ask you if you just were like good with money forever and super frugal, but you kind of did have some oh, lifestyle no. inflation over time. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, <laughs> I had that. I had the house in the suburbs. I had the supercharged Corvette. I had the brand new Cadillac CTS. I had the Yamaha R1 motorcycle. Um, I was not exactly a, um, I guess, a brilliant mind when it came to saving and investing. I did the 4%, like all through my career from day one, I did the 4% company match in my traditional 401k. That was, that was employee sponsored. So I was doing that. At least I was getting that and reducing my taxable income and getting the company match and all that. So I was doing the absolute bare minimum. And in my mind, after you do the minimum, guess what? Everything else is just open season. You could spend on whatever you want because you are saving, you are investing, and everything else could just be used to have fun. And that's kind of what I told myself for the first, I don't know, maybe 10 years of my working career, um, making good money, saving, investing, I could spend the rest. And that is absolutely what I did. Did you like your job and your career? Not even a little bit. Well, I guess I can't say that I, I can't say that I hated my job. I appreciated the income, um, but I worked in information technology and that's one of those sectors where you kind of have to get paid a lot of money. Otherwise nobody would freaking do it because it's very high stress. Nobody calls you unless something's broken. And that's happened a lot. doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's the middle of the night or on a weekend, you know, if something's broken, you're the IT guy, you have to fix it. Um, so I did not really, I, I, there was no sense of like satisfaction or like, yes, this is really what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. Uh, certainly none of that. I stayed working as long as I did because the pay was so good. Um, but it certainly was not my passion, not even close. So at what point did you start thinking, okay, if I just didn't have the Corvette, and if <laughs> and if I dialed down my lifestyle a little bit and some of these things that I wouldn't have to do this forever. What what made that happen? That mindset shift. There was a there was one day, I was maybe thirty one or thirty two at the time, and I was in my house in the suburbs. I was walking out to my garage. I walked into my garage and I, I reached up to open up the garage door as I normally would. I would I was going somewhere. I think it was a Saturday, so it wasn't work or anything. But instead of opening up the garage door, something stopped me, and I don't really know what, but something. Something stopped me and I just turned around and I looked at what was in my garage in the dark garage. I had my Cadillac, I had the motorcycle, I had the Corvette. And then I finally, that was the very first time where I said to myself, 
you know, I have all of these things. I am the hallmark of success or whatever, but yet I'm still not happy. Like something's missing. What am I going to do? There's no way I could just continue through my life acquiring all these things that I thought was making me happy, but really wasn't. So something has got to change here. And at that point, I mean, I I did not have all the pieces into place. I had no idea what I was going to do. It took several years to to kind of make all of that stuff come together, that final financial independence, early retirement, all those details. I had no idea about that. All I knew at that point was that there's a problem. I cannot go on like this. I don't necessarily know how to fix it yet, but... With that planted in the back of my head at that point, I I really started to think about things a little bit differently. Um, And when I met my wife and then we got married, that is really when the snowball started to build. Because now we have two incomes. She was a rocket scientist, an actual rocket scientist. And those two incomes by the end of our careers was a little over $200,000 combined by like the, the last year or two of our working careers. And this was back in 2012, 2013. So 200 grand is great today, but it was especially good back then. Um, so right. we had a, we had a choice to make. We could do the live like rock stars with the vacation homes and the nice dinners and cars and whatever. I already had the cars oh. part, or we can save <laughs> as much as we can quit our jobs and do what the heck we want to do for the rest of our lives. And I mean, long story short, we certainly chose the latter of that, of that equation, I guess. What a picture that is. I can see it. I feel like I can see myself turning around in your garage and looking at the Corvette and the Cadillac and the motorcycle. And and, wow. So there really was a moment Mm -hmm. for you. So I'm doing some math here. That aha moment happened at 31 or 32 and you were done with your job by 35. That should be, I think, pretty heartening for people that are listening to this. Yeah. And the advantage I had is I also had a working spouse. So if you don't have a working spouse, it's obviously going to look different for you. It might take you a little bit longer, or in fact, it probably will take you a little bit longer unless you are really high income. Uh, But yeah, at that point, I was like, not only did I not like my job, but now there is a way out. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And there is nothing that was going to stand in my way to get to that light as soon as possible. So that just became our this all-encompassing, I guess, goal for the next three or four years from that point. Save as much as we can, downsize our lifestyle, make as much as we can, which we already had a pretty good good feel for that. Um, and then quit and live the rest of our lives doing what we want to do. And for the three years directly after we quit our jobs, we actually sold both of our homes. We bought an Airstream RV and we traveled the country for a living. And that was one of the ways where we, one, got the, like the adventure bug in us, got to experience that, got to see a lot of new things, um, travel the country, but we also got to live almost as cheap as we wanted We didn't stay in campgrounds all that much. We stayed in BLM land, which is Bureau of Land Management. You can stay there. Most Bureau Hmm. of Land Management land, you can stay for two weeks in an RV completely free. You don't have to call anybody. You just show up. You park your RV. You leave two weeks later. It's all completely free. As long as you're self-contained, you bring your own water, you have solar power or generator or something. It's really just up to you. And we did that a lot. And boy, we lived so, so cheaply to the point where we were spending, I think the first couple of years after early retirement, we were spending 30 to 35,000 a year. That's it. That included insurance. That included, you know, our our daily, our daily lifestyle choices. Everything was included in that 30 to 35 K a year. So you go from making 200 spending, what, 150 of that to 30? (laughs) That was that. That's, that's it. That's yeah. like it, I, dialing down the spigot. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting when you want something bad enough, you tend to find a way to get it. I didn't want the high income. Yes, it was great. Of course, it allowed me to retire in my mid thirties. So I definitely appreciated that. But just making money 
for the sake of making money, that wasn't moving the needle for me. It was the freedom of doing whatever I want for the rest of my life that took priority. So for a lot of people, I mean, cutting your salary to almost nothing when you're making so much money, that might sound like a horrific proposition. But for us, it was exactly what we wanted to do because we were no longer commuting. We were no longer answering to bosses. We don't even own suits anymore. Or at least I don't own a suit anymore, no ties. It is a lifestyle of, you know, every single day you get up, you get to choose exactly what you want to do with your time. And for me, that was worth way more than pretty much any salary could have done for me. So not asking for a friend. Once you decide you want to <laughs> do the financial dependence retire early thing, how do you stay engaged in your job from that moment until you're done? Boy, that was tough. Oh, that was really tough. A lot of people assume that, oh, once you have that exit strategy, everything becomes easy. You don't have to, you know, you you may have to deal with some things now, but you know you're not going to have to deal with those things for the rest of your life and, and everything should just should be hunky-dory. Everything should be easy. Absolutely, 100% not true. In fact, the, the, the minute we decided to quit our jobs and retire, everything got tougher because I wanted to get to that point so fast that it's like, oh, I got to go to this meeting. Oh, next year I won't have to do this, but I really don't want to go. I just want it to be next year. You know, though that it was it's way tougher, at least for me, it's way tougher than I think a lot of people assume that it's gonna be once you have that light, you just want to get there as fast as possible. And I gave my boss six months notice. Thankfully, I worked for a nice guy and he was like, Steve, I obviously don't want you to go, but if I were in your position, I'd probably be be doing the same thing. And once my boss knew. Maybe things got a little bit easier because he wasn't looking at me like I was I was I'm trying to like rise up through the ranks and spend my career in this company. I was just doing a job and I was going to get lost. So I think the understanding between my boss and I kind of made it a little bit easier once that happened. Um, But it was certainly not an easy road after we had made the decision. That's for sure. Yeah, that's what we're experiencing right now is we have the vision. We know what we want to do. We know how we would design our days if we could, but we've got yep. to hang in there a little bit longer. Yeah. So did anything surprise you about how you felt when you were saving like 70 or whatever percent of your income? I think the one thing surprise that surprised me is the things that you think you can't live without, you can it's really not difficult. We're all adults here, right? I thought that I couldn't live without ESPN. I just had to have it. Then we canceled cable and I'm still alive. It's like, okay, this is, this really isn't that big of a deal. Yeah, I might miss some things. I don't get to watch Sports Center or a game here and there, whatever. You know what? It doesn't matter. When you have when you have something to look forward to in the future, when you have a goal that you're saving for and all this work that you're putting into, you know, I guess, curtailing your lifestyle, it makes those sacrifices along the way a little bit easier to stomach because there's a reason that you're making those sacrifices or something that you're working towards. Um, so the, for me, the most surprising thing is it's not that difficult to live a minimal lifestyle. It's not nearly as difficult as I thought it was going to be. The transition is tough going from like a world of stuff, all the crap that you have in your closet and garage and all that. And then paring that down to, we only have the essentials, what we actually need to live our lives and, and feel at least, you know, a little satisfied and happy and productive. Um, that transition was tough, but once you get into that new routine where you're living your life with less, it gets so, so easy. It's really not a big deal at all. So your wife meets this guy. He's got this garage full of toys. He's making good money. He's spending good money. How does the yeah. conversation go with her that, hey, I might want to retire super soon and I need to sell all of this. We need to sell our houses. Maybe we should buy an Airstream. How does all this go? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, she was a she was a saver. She wasn't a, like a hardcore saver, but she definitely saved more than I did. And she pretty much enjoyed her job. She really enjoyed the team that she was working with and her coworkers and all that. So she had to have something better. I just didn't like what I wanted to do. I 
it didn't, it almost didn't matter what early retirement was going to be like. <laughs> I just wanted out, but right. she was certainly not that way. So one of the things that, that happened during the lead up to making this decision is every single night after dinner, we would walk our dogs in, in the neighborhood and we would talk about what we wanted in our future, what we, what we thought that was going to look like. And the more we talked, the, the clearer this picture became and finding the middle ground between you and your spouse in terms of the, what the future is going to look like. That is so critically important. If you never talk, if you never communicate, this is going to be so much tougher for you because you're both going to have very different perspectives of what you want your future and what you want your retirement to look like. But if you talk about those things early and often, like we did, then you start to get closer and closer to the same page. And boom, once you both decide on something that works for both of you, that, I mean, the, that's really where the, the engine starts and you really make some progress fast. So over time, it took, it wasn't like I was pleading with her. It's like, please let me retire. Let's, let's do this. It, was, it wasn't <laughs> quite like that. But I think the more we talked about, oh, we can, we can take our Airstream and we can go wherever we want to. We can escape the summer in Arizona and just go up to Oregon or something and spend the summer there with a relatively cheap lifestyle. You know, as we talked about all those details, it really started to make sense that yes, this, this is, this sounds right. And we're going to pursue this with all that we have. Something else that is important about the communication aspect to financial dependence, retire early, at least on my side of things is sometimes I get a little more discouraged that we're not there yet. And sometimes the lifestyle gets a little bit harder than others. And sometimes I wonder why we're not living on the water and why we have a boat, why we have to put it in at a boat lift, boat ramp and, you know, <sighs> things like that. And my husband is usually not discouraged at the same time. So we can kind right. of keep each yeah. other like on track and keep it like focused on our goals as well. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I mean, you're, you're, you're all going to value different things. And that, I mean, that really makes it that much more important that you really do open up a, a a pretty solid line of communication and you do it regularly. It's not about it's not about judgment or or like criticism. It's just it's finding it's the 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 number one priority with communication is finding the common ground. And you might have to sacrifice some, they might have to sacrifice some, but as long as you both feel content with yeah, this is the solution. And that's, that's really where it all begins. And things start to happen quicker than you would imagine, especially if you both work. But even if you, even if there is only one income, uh, maybe the other person starts a side hustle or something, or maybe you put in a little bit more, more time at work, um, get some overtime. Those things happen once you're really determined and you're on the same page, uh, your goals are going to be I think for a lot of people, they're going to be much more easy to achieve than you probably assume. Yeah. So going back to when you guys sold your houses, kept your jobs for a little bit um, and started really saving a lot, what was your, did you have like a financial goal and how did you know what that was and how you're going to get there? I'm a very risk tolerant person and my wife is very risk averse. So she wanted like a million dollars before we retired. And I'm like, eh, we have like 700 K. Why don't we just call it good? And she's like, no, why don't we meet in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, the day that I quit my job, we had $870,000 in, in net worth. I think it was at, at, at the time. So, and, and that's, and that's one of, one of the, one of the other, you know, things that you have to talk about when you open up that line of communication. How do you know when you're done, whether you're using like the Trinity 4% study or some other way of yeah. calculating how much money you need. Maybe you look at your lifestyle and how much you anticipate spending. And that's certainly what we did. Um, especially after the first, you know, the first, you know, one, two, three years after retiring, we were like, how, you know, how much are we going to spend here? As long as we spend between 30,000 and 40,000 a year, we feel hundred percent confident retiring with a little under $900,000 in net worth, because we know that over time, the market is going to help us build wealth and we can live this lifestyle almost as cheaply as we possibly can. So as long as we stay, stay disciplined, which we did, there should be no problem with retiring with that amount of money. 
And in our, our case, there certainly wasn't because we were disciplined. The market was doing well. Um, and we actually, we actually realized that we can start spending more money than we had anticipated going into like year three, I think it was. It's like maybe... Maybe we do a few more things. Maybe we travel a little bit more, stay in more campgrounds or buy, you know, top shelf booze, you know, whatever it is. We can start spending a little <laughs> bit more because we really understand uh, our lifestyle and, and what's going to make us happy and how much money that's going to take. Absolutely. And then inflation made that happen for you anyways. So, <laughs> Well, especially, yeah, now it's, it's, it's rough now with inflation and all numbers are pointing to a recession in 2023. Nobody knows what's going to happen. I'm not trying to predict the future, but it's now is an interesting time to be in the fire community because now it's really where all the, the safeguards that you put in place, like your emergency fund, um, that's where it really comes in. You have to start making some decisions, some potentially hard decisions about maybe cutting back on a few things if you don't have that consistent income. So uh, it's it's certainly been a roller coaster, but I think it's been an exciting one for us. That's for sure. It's easier to do this when you have high salaries than not. So for anybody out there that maybe isn't making two hundred thousand dollars as a couple, can they still do this? Sure, they can do it. They may not be able to do it at thirty five. And whenever I talk about my story. I really want to get this point across. This is not about retiring in your 30s. Not everybody is going to be able to do this. Yes, we did it. We both had high high incomes and we took advantage of that. But you might be surprised at how many millionaires there are out there who never earned six-figure salaries in their career. So this is absolutely possible, but it's going to take longer and it might take more of a sacrifice, but it is possible. Retiring at 45 is early retirement. 55 is early retirement. It's not about retiring at 35 or on my schedule. It's about your schedule. It's about what you want out of your life and what you see your future looking like. So don't use my retirement number as some kind of discouraging factor. Instead, really buckle down and take a look at your finances, how much you're you're bringing in, how much you're spending, what you have in investments and savings and and really and that's really where it becomes it gets real that way when you're using your numbers and you know what you want to do in your future 5 years 10 years 15 years down down the line i i i think that is the most important part whenever you hear a story like mine is take the story as inspiration but don't judge yourself because you don't make as much money that's fine few people do but if you use your salary in the right way and you're very efficient with your money and you save and invest, I think I think you're going to be able to retire sooner than you think you are. Well said. Absolutely. I just had to ask because, you know, we're both on Twitter. We know what that's like. So Boy, we, we talked about financially. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about financially the number you need to re- needed to retire. Is there anybody personality wise or emotionally or anything like that. Is there any type of person who is not suited to retiring early? Yeah. If you don't have a hobby, if you have nothing to do, if you love your, <laughs> if, if your job is your only hobby, I think that's a red flag. That doesn't necessarily mean you can't retire early because there, there are many things that you can do as hobbies that you used to do as a full-time job. So it, it's, it, it's not exactly like a one or zero or true or false or go or not go kind of thing. There's some gray area there, but you, if you don't feel productive after you quit, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a really hard time. And I want you to picture something here, picture a bell curve, right? So you're going through your career, you're unhappy, you want to retire early and you're on this, 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 this plane of, eh, it's fine, but I I really don't want, don't want to be doing this. You finally get to early, early retirement and your happiness just shoots right up. It skyrockets. You just could not be happier. You get up whenever you want. You watch Netflix, you, you know, you do whatever, but there's a point in time and it might be two weeks. It might be two months. Heck, it might be two years. It depends on the person, but there comes a time where you begin to realize I can't just watch TV all day. At the end of the day, if I've done nothing every single day, 
that starts to wear on you. We all need to feel productive. So that's at the top of the bell curve where your happiness stops increasing and it actually levels out. But it gets worse if you don't find a way to fix it. If you don't find that kind of purpose in your life, some kind of hobby or something else to do with your time, maybe volunteering, your happiness level begins to decrease and you get back down. If it, if, if it stays that way long enough, you go back down to where you were before and you're not making the money that you were before. So it's possible that your happiness level is actually below what it was before. So that is the, that's what I like to call the early retirement bell curve when it comes to happiness. So if you don't have something productive to do with your time, if you don't have a hobby for me, it's like getting involved in social media and I have an ebook and I have courses and I'm, I'm a big content creator. That's what gets me up every day. And I know you, you are, you're very much the same way, but if there's nothing out there for you, don't quit your job until you find it. That was amazingly said. Thank you. I also want to ask about living off the grid. How related is that to financial independence? Is it kind of a feature of it or is it just kind of coincidentally something, a direction that you went? We never set out to live off grid. So I guess it's, I guess for us, it was more coincidental, at least at first. I think we started to get a feeling for, you know, in the Airstream, when we can live on BLM land with solar, we provide all of our utilities. That was our first exposure to how cool it is to live this really highly sustainable lifestyle. And I'm not exactly this environmentalist kind of guy. I just like to know that I'm producing my own power. I'm recording this podcast with you on the solar we have right outside. I have no grid tie to the electrical system whatsoever. And yeah, it is cheaper, like zero, literally zero power bill, no water bill, (laughs) no sewer bill, nothing. We have some property taxes, like a hundred dollars a year property taxes, so low. So this lifestyle is definitely, yeah, I know this lifestyle is definitely not going to be for everybody. However, for us, it really helps keep our lifestyle expenses down. And it's, it's not as boring as you might think. I mean, yeah, there's going to be some city people where you just need the city stimulus and that's fine. There's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, but for us, it really started to, it, it put the pieces in the place and let us, I guess, get a little bit more flexible. I'll say it that way with our spending and what we can do, because we know that we can cut back so much if we have to virtually all of our spending is, is discretionary. I'll say that one more time. Virtually all of our spending is discretionary. And when you're in that, um, when you're in that kind of scenario, when things do get rough, you can cut way back to almost nothing because you don't have those monthly bills. Amazing. So there's some people listening right now who maybe have heard of the financial independence retire early movement maybe haven't, maybe have been like, I want to be better with my money so I can even retire at 65. And this might be the first time that they're really thinking about, wow, I can retire years, if not decades before that. What advice do you have for them? Well, I think the primary bit of advice would be if you have a spouse, talk to your spouse, understand what you both want and get on the same page. That is always without exception the, the very first thing that you should do. Because if you're, on, if you're on a very different page, I don't care what you do, it's not going to work. You need to be on the same page. Then once you know what that future is going to look like, then you can work backwards from there. Really get a feel for what, you're, what you think your days are going to be filled with, how much money that's going to take. And then you can extrapolate that to your yearly spending and then work backwards from there even further so you know how much you should be making, how much you should be saving, and how much you should be investing now so you can get to that point in the future. But if if things are all kind of like fuzzy, you don't really know what you want to do. You just know that you want to quit your job. That is a recipe for disaster. So I really like to encourage people to not retire from something like retiring from your job. You're not doing that. You're retiring to something. You're retiring to your next life, your your next lifestyle. That 
is the important element that you, that everybody needs to, I guess, keep in mind here. You're not retiring from, you're retiring to. And once you understand what that to is, it's going to be way, way easier to figure out how to put the pieces into place to make that happen. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? You know, I usually end with exactly that, what what, what I just said. So I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Perfect. So, Steve, why don't you tell people how they can get in touch with you? I spend a lot of time, and I mean a lot of time, on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Steve on Speed. The on Speed part came when I would when I drove my Corvette. It has nothing to do with drugs or anything like that. I just like to drive fast, so that's where that's where that came from. I'm, I also have a blog at steveatcock.us, and I'm on Instagram at Millionaire Habits without the A and the I in habits. Millionaire Habits, all one word. I will put that in the show notes. I assumed Steve on speed meant you were speeding to retirement, by the way. That's good. I never thought of that. That's great. That's great. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate you that. I might, u- I, I, I might use that for now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So everybody, you can follow me on Twitter. Also, I'm at Adulting is Easy. I started a YouTube channel as well. Please subscribe there. I'm also on Facebook. You can email me at realadultingiseasy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Hopefully, Steve and I have made adulting a little easier for you. (laughs) 